Okay, so we are going to talk about special conditions uh, and we start off with the latent tuberculosis. Uh, so I think we have already seen this particular slide, so I'm going to skip this slide. But it's when you have a contact and now we're going into national TB elimination. So we are doing severe contact testing, even in adults and children. So when you have a contact and you have a risk of developing disease, you want to treat every patient with latent TB. So the transmission is going to be based on a lot of things. If your contact is very high, sputum positive, chances are going to be there. If there are behaviors, a lot of people cough without uh, you know, covering their mouth. So if they have that kind of a habit of coughing, then the transmission is there. If you have an age, if you have a younger child, as we know, less than five years, the risk of getting a disease is much higher. If you have HIV infection or you are on some immunosuppressor, then your chance of getting a disease is much higher. So this slide also has been talked about, so I'm not going to talk about that. What is important is you need to diagnose these patients early. They are infection, they are not disease, so they don't have any symptoms. They are just infected, so you need to get them. You need to have airborne infection control practices. I don't know how many of you all have a window in your clinic and an AC, but do you keep the window open? In my clinic, I sit with the AC on and with the window open because I need these air changes to take place. So keep in mind your airborne infection control practices. Uh, at Vadia, with Dr. Puri's help and uh, Dr. Tipre's help, we designed the opening such a way that we have changes of around 300 air changes in an hour. Even the TB isolation ward that we have, we have around 300 to 400 air changes in an hour. The normal recommended is around 6 to 12 air changes in an hour, which in an air-conditioned room will take place. So when you have this natural ventilation that takes place with such a high air change, the chance of getting infected is much, much lesser. So even in your clinic when you're practicing, please keep in mind that you need your air changes to take place. And then obviously we have TPT and BCG vaccine that is there as part of latent TB treatment. So most important is keep your windows and doors open. Okay, this even to your contacts or your patients, you need to tell them that they need to keep the windows and doors open. Preferably, nobody else should sleep in that room. If they have multiple rooms in the house, then nobody else should sleep in that room. You should keep at least three feet distance between the beds or between the patients. Use a surgical mask for the patient. You wear an N95, but otherwise for the patient, covering the mouth and nose while sneezing and coughing. And you use tissues. If you're using tissues, then dispose them up properly. Otherwise, if you're using towels, then it has to be washed separately. So these are small things, hand hygiene, small things that will help to prevent infection. We all are talking about TPT, but I think these are small things that help to prevent spread of infection. So who should be screened? Everybody. Whoever a contact has to be screened. We earlier used to say only children. Now I say even adults. Everybody should be screened. And in case of pediatric TB patient, go back to reverse tracing, contact tracing for the adults. Less than five years, we treat them with TPT irrespective of whether they are infected or not. Now how to test them? We all said IGRA is going to be the test and not Mantu test. But uh, remember negative IGRA cannot conclusively exclude a diagnosis of LTP. The earlier IGRA that we were using in 2014 was just quantiferon. That was not reliable in children less than 4 years of age. It was not reliable in children with HIV infection. These newer generation of IGRAs, now the age group has come down to around 18 months. But below 18, again, IGRA is not that great. So again, it would be a lot of clinical judgment that you will have to take. So these are the various tests you have. This is the Mantu test, this is the CTB, and this is Quantiferon TB Gold test. The most important thing is the specificity is high for CTB and Quantiferon TB Gold, and it's very less for uh, Mantu test. And your, you can, for all these three tests, you cannot predict <coughs> disease versus infection. But what is most likely is that you will get the, G, uh, the antigens used are different. So you will get sensitivity, specificity more for uh, latent TB in case of MTB in these patients. So these are, this is an algorithm for TPT screening. If you have any HIV positive patient, 
he comes with any of the symptoms of cough, fever, weight loss, night sweats. This can be also part of HIV disease. Okay. So if it is there, you investigate for active TB. If it's not active TB, every HIV positive patient will go on to preventive therapy if there is no contraindication. What is the contraindication? Suppose the child has hepatitis, you can't give INH. So hepatitis, peripheral neuropathy, those are contraindications. If there is contraindication, you will defer the preventive therapy. If there is no contraindication, you give TPT. This is for HIV positive. Now you have a household contact. And if the patient is symptomatic, then you investigate for active TB. And then you take the same path. If it is not symptomatic, the child is less than 5 years, and you will straight away start preventive therapy. Okay, Less than 5 years, straight away go for preventive therapy. If the child is more than 5 years, you may do IGRA. I would not recommend TST. You would straight away do IGRA. If it's positive, do a chest x-ray. If it's abnormal, investigate for active TB. If it's normal, give preventive therapy. Is this clear? Am I clear in that? So any other risk group, suppose you, a lot of times you get references, uh, we are planning to give uh, the child a biological agent. So they want to give a biological agent and they want to rule out TB before starting biological agent. What do you do? So then you go for an IGRA. So this will be, because nowadays we are using too many biological agents in children. So again, IGRA, if positive, rule out active TB and then start treatment. So you will have to give TPT in these patients. So people living with HIV, any adult or child more than 12 months, infants less than 12 months with HIV in contact with active TB, you will give TPT after ruling out active disease. What is the TPT that you give? Either you give three months of weekly isoniazid rifapentin, which will be available in the program soon, or you give six months of daily INH. Now, I'll tell you the problems with, there are too many regimes that WHO has come out with. Okay, they've come out with this three weekly, I mean, three, uh, once a week for three months, six months of INH, four months of rifampicin. So there are a lot of combinations for permutations. Why? Because one thing is when you tell a patient, look, he doesn't have TB, but I'm still going to give you six months therapy, in their mind it plays that it's a TB disease that we're treating. Okay, so they sometimes are very worried that we are treating for a TB disease. A lot of times they don't finish this six months therapy. So that's one issue with INH. So you will have to decide the regimen based on what your patient will uh, be compliant with. Weekly regimen is easy because you can give weekly three months. Problem is we forget to take. Okay, once a week if I tell somebody you have to take once a week, we forget to take. So that is a one problem with that. If I talk about rifampicin, which is not part of the program, the problem with rifampicin, single drug, is we'll cause resistance. I'll give you an example. I do the gastro department also. So we have children with PFIC. And with PFIC, they get intractable pruritus, which is so intractable that you actually end up doing a transplant for their pruritus. So the drugs that we use, we use naltriaxone, we use Udilib, uh, UDCA, we use sometimes phenobarbitone. Rifampicin is one of the drugs to be used for that. And two or three patients, we've started rifampicin. I was very scared of starting rifampicin, single drug, as part of pruritus management and not TB management. But then there was no option. Otherwise, I would have posted the child for liver transplant. Mm -hmm. So in a country like ours, where we are talking about MDR, and you know single drug rifampicin can cause resistance, to put a single drug rifampicin for four months, we would be pushing more towards MDR. So that's why the program has not adopted that regimen. Okay, for rifampicin. So we are only on two regimens, six months INH or three uh, weekly this. All the other risk groups, the ones who are going on biologicals, dialysis, immunosuppressive agents, you have to rule out active TB and start them on treatment. So this is for TB screening and TPT, all household contacts of pulmonary TB. Now sometimes you have patients that uh, contact with your TBM. <laughs> Do you do contact tracing in these patients? You know, adults, they sometimes have TBM. Do you do contact tracing? Or you have a child who has come with extra pulmonary TB. Do you do a contact tracing in those? The contact tracing is recommended for pulmonary TB. Children over one year living with HIV AIDS, irrespective of HIV, TB exposure, you ask for TB symptoms. Is If it's yes, 
to investigate for TB disease. If it's TB, treat for TB. No TB or there are no TB symptoms, less than 5 years, you just start TPT. Okay, if it's more than 5 years, you test and treat. So you would be doing your IGRA and then deciding whether to treat or not. Now, if you are going to do this, I think half the population in India will be on treatment. Yes. Yeah, so we have to prioritize. We have to take only those who are confirmed pulmonary TB patients and their contacts. Okay, not everybody. If we did IGRAs for every one of us, we would be probably positive. So, I don't think we have to just go towards asymptomatic patients. It has to be only bacteriologically confirmed. And uh, so the treatment, as I said, six months of INH or three months weekly INH refer pentin. If you have an MDR contact, earlier we used to say wait and watch because we didn't have a regimen. But you could give levoflox provided the contact is fluoroquinolone sensitive. If the contact is fluoroquinolone resistant, you cannot use levoflox. You'll have to wait and watch and see if the child develops a new. <coughs> and if there is INH mono poly resistance, it's four months of daily rifampicin. I'm scared for this. Now the dose. If you are giving INH, remember it's 10 mg per kg per day, but don't exceed more than 300 mg. So if you have an older child, you may be giving a range of around 5 mg per kg per day, but don't exceed 300. So you remember 10 mg per kg per day, not more than 300 mg. That's all that you remember. Don't remember anything else. These are the weight bands for uh, isoniazid, rifampentin, weekly dose. You can't remember this. Take a photo of this, take a print out of this, laminate it, <coughs> put it on your desk. Every time you get a patient, refer to this chart, to using the dose. So just take these weight bands. I think uh, Sushma will be talking about the drug sensitive TB and she'll be talking about the weight bands and the FDCs. Again, FDCs, how to remember is difficult. So it's better to take a print out of this and keep it with you. Levofloxacin, again, there are weight bands that we use, but in general, remember, it's 15 mg per kg. So if you're going to remember it as weight, remember it that way. And four months of rifampicin when we are using, you age 10 years and above, you'll use 10 mg per kg. And less than 10 years, it'll be 15 mg per kg. Again, the dose of rifampicin, remember, don't exceed more than 450 to 600. Levoflox, don't exceed more than 750. So how do you ensure compliance or when do you say the patient has been adherent? How many of you all finish five day course of azithromycin? <laughs> or seven days of amoxicillin? Uh, azithromycin is the only one we get complete. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know my students don't, <laughs> not even that. So when we say adherence, we say 80% of the recommended dose of six months. And if you are talking about three months, that is a weekly regimen, it has to be 90%. And if you are talking about four months of rifampicin, it has to be 80%. So that's when you say that they have been compliant to the therapy. So this was about latent TB. HIV and TB co-infection. I think this was, uh, you know, the epidemic that we used to see uh, around 10 years back, where HIV and TB were going hand in hand. Nowadays, TB is outnumbered HIV by, because HIV has actually gone down. So, it used to be said that TB patients are more prone to HIV and HIV patients are more prone towards TB. So, people with HIV are 18 times more likely to develop TB than the non-HIV infected patients. And if you see, the TB HIV co-infection rate in 2019 was 3.4%. So, that's quite a large number. When I talk about HIV, to say a uh, area is epidemic for HIV, that means my community should have 2% HIV incidence. And to say HIV and TB co-infection is 3.4%. So it's pretty large number. Now, the problem with diagnosing TB and HIV is a lot of times we used to actually do clinically diagnose because we didn't have gene expert at that time. The problem is most of the symptoms are very similar to PCP. It's very similar to LIP. So they all come with fever, cough, weight loss, and HIV itself. <coughs> so it's very difficult to diagnose TB in these patients. So always keep in mind LIP may be there, PCP may be there, 
weight loss and failure to thrive are more. So keep that in mind. So always try and get a bacteriological diagnosis. So the four symptoms screening, fever, cough, weight gain, contact with the TB case. If you have one or more symptom, then take it as a presented TB case in HIV. Whereas if you have all four symptoms that are absent, then it's unlikely that the child has TB. So if you have an <coughs> HIV infected child, and you have one of the symptoms that is there, which I listed out, you take it as presumptive TB, you take the NATS, you do an X-ray, if the smear or the expert is positive, you have a bacteriological positive TB. If the smear and the NAT is negative, if the X-ray is suggestive of TB, it will be a clinically diagnosed TB. If the smear and NAT are negative, X-ray is negative, it is supposed to be non-TB. But if you have a presumptive extra pulmonary TB, you do a NAT and a culture smear positive from the extra pulmonary side. And that would be positive, you treat it as extra pulmonary TB. You may need cytology, histopathology, X-ray chest, whatever is suggestive of TB, you will have to treat it as extra pulmonary TB. So this is a, so in HIV, our threshold is very less to start AKD. It starts much faster. The problem is you may see an LIP on an X-ray and you may get confused that this is TB or LIP. And a uh, lot of times HIV infected patients can have TB with normal chest X-rays. They could still be having TB. So keep that also in mind. Again, if you're using tuberculin skin tests, it will be five millimeters that you take as positive. And there is no evidence in HIV that IGRA is more sensitive than TST. So that is a problem because it's a completely different immune system. So whether the patient is going to release interferon gamma, it's doubtful. So IGRA may not help you in HIV positive patients. So sputum smear is not going to help and NAT will be your first line, front line that you will have to do in these patients. Treatment is the same as for non-HIV. So for drug sensitive, it's going to be six months. For, she's already talked about extra parmi, the duration of the therapy. After six months of therapy are over, in HIV, you will give six months of INH preventive therapy, TPT, to prevent HIV from, I mean, from TB from coming back. And I think pyridoxine now is recommended for every child, so it doesn't matter even in HIV you have to give. Now, when do you start ART in patients with TB? You have, once you've started TB treatment, you start ART as soon as your TB is slightly under control. So that can be anywhere between two weeks to two months. And whenever you design an ART regimen with your TB treatment, you have to design a regimen that has least drug interactions. <coughs> so for example, rifampicin is a potent inducer of P450. So there are drugs like your NRTIs, your PIs, NNRTIs and your PIs, you won't be able to use with uh, rifampicin. Same way for betaquilin. It is metabolized by the CYP3A4. So you again have multiple interactions with your PIs and your NNRTI. So when you're designing a regimen, you have to keep these interactions in mind. So if you have a, even if when you're using dolutegravir, nowadays your first line for uh, HIV, more than 10 years is tenofovir, lamivudin and dolutegravir. So if you're using this regimen, and you're using this, I'm talking about patients who are receiving rifampicin-based therapy. Ideally, what we used to do is we used to uh, shift rifampicin to rifabutin. So that way the drug interactions were much less. But nowadays we can use because there are regimens in ART which we can modify. So if you're using rifampicin, dolutegravir has to be doubled. Okay, double the dose. Only thing is you need to give it double the dose for two weeks after the last dose of rifampicin. If you're using lopinavir based regimen, earlier we used to have a lot of PIs. We used to have indinavir, sakvinavir, all those are gone. Now we have lopinavir, ritonavir, atazanavir, ritonavir. So when you're using lopinavir, ritonavir, you again, you will have to super boost lopinavir with additional ritonavir. Okay? So very confusing. So just remember if you're going to use rifampicin with ART, there are drug interactions. If you're going to use betaquilin with ART, there are drug interactions. So design the regimen that way. This is for the ART regimens that I use, but I'm not going to go back into these regimens because these are uh, pretty much uh, complex. The second line drugs, again, if you're going to have a DRTB, start with the second line drugs first, get it under control. After two weeks or maybe two weeks to two months, start the 
ART in these patients. And BDQ, be cautious if you're using efavirenz or lopinavir, ritonavir. Okay, these two drugs you have to be careful. And dolitogravir, which is your first line regimen, can be used safely in these patients. And uh, co-trimoxazole, you can use an HIV-TB patient's combination. You don't have to worry about that. So again, in HIV patients, when you have these regimens, you will be monitoring liver function tests more frequently as compared to what you do for non-HIV patients. And I'm going to skip the slide on iris because we don't need to uh, talk about that. Now, BCG adenitis. Okay, this is another special situation. How many of you all have seen BCG adenitis? How, how many months after BCG? Okay, so BCG adenitis can come even up to one year. Okay, so it's not that uncommon. Only thing is, remember, it will be either in the left axilla or the left supraclavicular gland. And uh, so we had a three-month-old child. He had a left axillary swelling, had received BCG at birth. There was a BCG mark. There was a left axillary gland, which was two centimeters, non-fluctuant, non-tender. What would you do? No. Why would you suspect immunocompromise? This is BCG atenitis. Immunocompromise you will suspect when it's disseminated. So you have a liver, spleen, you have chest signs, failure to thrive. Then you say disseminated BCG. So this is standard BCG. Suppose it has gone subcute, you can get a BCG adenitis. Or somebody who has a reaction to the BCG can get a BCG adenitis. So what should you do? We did an ultrasound, it showed pus. So it was, though it was non-fluctuant, if it's fluctuant, you straight away aspirate the pus. Okay. Remember, you don't do IND, no incision. Because if you make an incision, there will be a sinus. Mm -hmm. Either it has to be aspiration or it has to be excision. So no IND. So this short pass, so needle aspiration was tried, but it failed. So then we referred to the pediatric surgeon and excision was done. Pass culture, ARBC, gene expert showed MTB. Okay. Now he was referred to us for starting anti-TB treatment. What would you do? So you don't need to do anything because there's no residual gland, you don't need to start AKT. Okay? So remember BCG adenitis doesn't require TB treatment. Either you do aspiration, you may need to do aspiration multiple times or you may do excision. If you have to do multiple times aspiration, it's better to do excision and just remove the gland. If there is a residual gland that remains behind or you find there is a gland that is increasing in size now, then probably you may consider, but not otherwise. Regular BCG adenitis, no treatment required. So there are two forms of BCG adenitis. Either you have simple, non-suppurative, which will regress on its own. You don't need to do anything. Or you have suppurative, which is fluctuation, or you have pus development. And if, so non-suppurative, no treatment. If you have suppurative, you do needle aspiration. When will you do surgical excision? Only if there's a failed needle aspiration, or in a child with matted and multiloculated. You don't do IND, okay? There is just no role of IND. And when is AKT required? When there's a residual inflammatory tissue left behind. How will you know that? The gland again starts increasing. That's the time. Reappearance, or there's disseminated BCGosis. And when you design a res regimen for BCGosis, remember pyrazinamide doesn't work. Lot of BCG strains are also resistant to INH. So when you design a regimen, you will have to be very careful when you design a regimen for BCG adenitis. So size of BCG adenitis is not a marker to decide about treatment. Only disseminated BCGosis requires anti-TB treatment. If gland gets superated, then drainage. If drainage fails multiple times, drainage fails, then excision and drainage. After <laughs> drainage or excision, if the gland reappears, enlarges, then you may consider ATT and no B PZA when you are designing the regimen. Now you, the last slide, the, so everybody is smiling. So neonate born to a mother with TB. So you have three likely situations here. Mother has active TB when the baby was born. 
it may it doesn't matter here whether it's PTB or ETB. Mother has completed treatment but was having the disease when she was carrying the baby. Or there's another contact with a pulmonary TB. It's not the mother. Okay, so if you have a neonate, he's exposed. You check for the vitals, hepatosplenomegaly, you check the respiratory system. You do a chest x-ray, never forget ultrasound abdomen. Because congenital TB comes with lymph nodes at the portal, portal lymph nodes, jaundice. So never forget to do ultrasound abdomen. You didn't find any active disease, just give IPT, INH, isoniazide for six months. And you have to teach the mother cough etiquette, that she has to cover her mouth while she's coughing and not in front of the child. If the mother is a DRTB, you will still give TPT to the baby after removing of active TB and TPT as per the protocols. So if it's levoflux, if it's polymono resistance, you will give rifampicin. When do you give BCG vaccine? INH works on BCG vaccine. So this is where the discrepancy comes. If I'm going to give BCG vaccine and I'm going to give IPT, my INH is going to nullify the BCG vaccine. So ideal time to give BCG vaccine would be after six months of therapy is over. It's not protective at that moment. My protection is because of the INH. So finish the INH prophylaxis or finish your rifampicin or finish your levoflux and then give your BCG vaccine. Okay, so this is most important. Please remember that. This is, this was what the Indian guidelines said and this is one article that I picked up from the archives of diseases in childhood. This is what the Western world does. And what do they do? They actually give TST at six months of age. So they finish the IPT. They give a TST. If it's negative, they give BCG. If it's positive, I don't know how BCG will protect. Because the TST is all the child has already got. So this is what they do. But what I would say, six months later after INH is over, give the BCG vaccine. Okay, but not simultaneously, not with INH together. So please keep that in mind. So latent TB, role of IGRA is superior to TST. There are multiple regimens for treating latent TB. There is HIV and TB, role of TPT. Before, first is when you've started ART and you're putting them on IPT, that is isoniazide preventive therapy. If the child had active TB, after TB treatment is over, another six months of IPT. And keep a watch for drug interactions. Newborns with maternal TB, rule out congenital TB. TPT followed by BCG vaccine. Okay. So thank you very much.